Say yes. Draw. There's a new toy in town. Go! Animators have discovered computers. They're here! And the face of animation is about to change forever. With Toy Story, the first computer animated feature film in the history of motion pictures. In the next half hour, we're going to go behind the scenes to see who's who and what's what with this amazing new film from Pixar and Walt Disney Pictures. So get your eyeballs focused and your volume adjusted, and let's go to infinity and beyond! When people aren't around, toys come to life. You knew that, right? That's me, Annie Potts. Don't let it get you down, Woody. In Toy Story, I'm the voice of Bo Peep, a porcelain lamp who has a big crush on a cowboy doll named Woody. Oh, hi, Bo. What do you say I get someone else to watch the sheep tonight? <laughs> Hell yeah. The film tells the story of Woody, an old-fashioned pull-string toy, and Buzz Lightyear, a supercharged action figure who threatens to take over as the top toy in Andy's room. Woody! Who's up there with you? Hello? Oh, yeah! Ah! Oh! <laughs> Impressive wingspan. Look at him. He's got more gadgets on him than a Swiss Army knife. Toy Story features the voices of Tom Hanks and Tim Allen and music by Grammy winner Randy Newman. But it was the film's director, John Lasseter, who guided all of us involved in Toy Story toward the computer animated world that existed only in his imagination. I felt like I was on to something new. And I was on to something that I was like, we were like pioneers. And it was so exciting. Every day you would go to work and there would be like something new on the monitor, on the screen, and you're like, wow, that's great! John Lasseter, whose creative vision shaped the film, has the enthusiasm of a kid on the loose in a candy shop. <laughs> Sometimes it's kind of hard to tell if John is working or playing. Any similarities between Andy's room, which is the home to all the toys in Toy Story, and John Lasseter's office are more than just a coincidence. See for yourself. These are like some of my favorite toys. I've had these for a while. Now, these guys are amazing. They're, they're like little robot things. One of the things I like about them the most is they have a sense of personality to them. This is it's not only an Etch-a-Sketch, but it's my Etch-a-Sketch as a little boy. Now, if you get look closely, see right there what it says? Johnny. It's mine. That was mine. It looks as though I've been accepted into your culture. Your chief, Andy, inscribed his name on me. Wow! With permanent ink, too! Well, I must get back to repairing my ship. Every animator in his heart is a toy nut. Every animator is a child at heart. I mean, I think you have to be to be in this medium. And so, you walk around Pixar, you walk around Disney for that matter, and it's like every desk practically is filled with toys. Tuesday night's plastic corrosion awareness meeting was, I think, a big success. And Woody, which is Andy's favorite toy when the movie starts, was kind of based on a toy that I had when I was a little kid. This is my Casper from when I was a little boy. This is probably 30, 37 years old. And see, he has a pull string. See, that's, can I stay with you? It's like a, it's like a parent understanding their child's, um, you know, words. See, that's, I'm a friendly ghost. You're my favorite deputy. Buzz Lightyear was actually derived from the G.I. Joe. Now, you know, once I grew out of Casper, I was into G.I. Joe's in a big way. And so we thought, you know, as an action figure, we'd update him and stuff. But he's, Buzz Lightyear's about the, the same size as G.I. Joe. Buzz Lightyear to Star Command. Come in, Star Command. Star Command, come in. Do you read me? Why don't they answer? So the whole thing with Buzz Lightyear, of course, is he doesn't know he's a toy. He thinks he's really Buzz Lightyear, Space Ranger, Defender of the Galaxy. I'm stationed up in the Gamma Quadrant of Sector 4. 
as a member of the elite Universe Protection Unit of the Space Ranger Corps. I protect the galaxy from the threat of invasion from the evil Emperor Zerg, sworn enemy of the Galactic Alliance. Buzz Lightyear is well trained. You know, he's been through the state Space Academy. He is taught. He's toned. So, you want to do it the hard way, huh? Don't even think about it, cowboy. Oh, yeah? Tough guy? For the voices of Woody and Buzz, Lasseter cast two very big stars who Something had never like performed in an animated film before. From the beginning, for the voices of Woody and Buzz, we really wanted Tom Hanks and Tim Allen. I mean, they, they, hit, they were great. It's because of you! Security the entire universe is in And you, my friend, are responsible for delaying my rendezvous with Star Command. Good riddance, you loony! Like the toys they portray, Hanks and Allen were sort of a study in clashing styles. Tom, for instance, did his homework. Uh, Woody is a, uh, he's a classic um, uh, piece of Americana. He's a piece of American folklore and arts and crafts. He's the old-fashioned... Just a mistake. Western, loose-limbed, marionette without the strings. He's got uh, he's got a vocabulary that is stored in a wire in his chest, and he's got a pull string on it, and he says things like, "Somebody's poisoned the water hole." Is Tom a lot nicer than me? But I'm better looking than he is, aren't I? While Tim brought a, a lot of himself to the role, oh, a right. whole lot of himself, yeah. as it turns that out. Toy Story is essentially, of course, a movie about my character. Boy, is he handsome. And that's why it came to me, because it, it seemed to fit me. It seemed to be me, you know, with this... I have so much emotional strength. So it's always me, 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 me. That's what drives me, is me. Over the two years it took to record the voices, definite opinions were formed. And those opinions were... Come on! Definitely divided. Buzz is a, a twit. Now oh, you're an action figure! Woody is a arrogant, thin, ugly, misshapen toy. You are a sad, strange little man. Maybe it's just he's been bre breathing that purified air behind his space helmet for a little too long, or maybe just he's like inhaled a few too many ions from his propulsive drive rocket thruster booster thing. You're mocking me, aren't you? Oh, no, 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 no. Buzz, look at Alien! Where? Ultimately, it was up to the director to find the right chemistry for a classic buddy story in which Woody and Buzz are thrust together by fate. Buzz, will you get up here and give me a hand? And then have to work out their differences to survive. You know, and the great thing is, the computer has finally gotten to the point where animators can use it, and they're powerful enough, to get those performances onto the screen. What happened to you? One minute you're defending the whole galaxy, and suddenly you find yourself sucking down Darjeeling with Marie Antoinette and her little sister. Just a couple of years ago, it would not have been possible. I think you've had enough tea for today. In the 1960s, computer art was as crude as the computers that were used to create it. My name is Ralph. I am a siliconian. One frame of Toy Story is so unbelievably complex and detailed. And when you compare that with the computer graphics and computer animation that was being done in the early 70s, I mean, they were just like single points of light moving around on, on the screen. As the computers got more powerful, the artists who were using them were able to get more artistic. The movement became far more fluid, the textures were richer, and the lighting came from, they were able to use multiple light sources. I was working at Disney as an animator on Mickey's Christmas Carol, doing Goofy and Donald and Scrooge McDuck and so on. And very, two very close friends of mine were working on Tron. You, know, you remember Tron, right? The moment I saw it, it was like a little door in my head opened up and it was like, this is the future. This is amazing. And it wasn't for what I was seeing. 
It was the potential I saw in computer animation. Lasseter left Disney in 1983 to join some of the world's top computer scientists like Bill Reeves and Ed Catmull to form the nucleus of a new computer graphics company called Pixar. Their mission? To create the world's first computer animated feature film. We weren't interested in anything that moved or flying logos. We wanted to have characters and objects come to life. And this is where John is the master. At Pixar, Lasseter directed a series of experimental short films, beginning with Luxo Jr. in 1986. The life came out of purely the movement of it, you know, and the limitations, you know, the, the way that, that the baby moved in comparison to the father clearly said, you know, here's a parent and here's a child. In Red's Dream, one of the things we, we tried to get was, was mood, you know, dark, rich mood. And I think we were able to achieve something that no one had seen in computer animation before, and that's this, this you know, like atmosphere this dark, rainy city streets at night and, and, and stuff. It was really interesting. In 1988, Tin Toy won the Academy Award as Best Animated Short. John Lasseter's unique point of view was coming more into focus all the time. Turns out, John sees the world through the eyes of a toy. In Tin Toy, I first started developing this notion of a juxtaposition with the audience. It's where you can show them something that they are so familiar with. And then all of a sudden you make them look at it from a, point of, a different point of view. Tin Toy was followed by another experimental film called Knick Knack and a series of very lively television commercials. With every project, Pixar was pushing the possibilities of computer animation. This did not go unnoticed back at the studio that Walt built. The Walt Disney Studios has a long history of breakthroughs in entertainment technology. Whether it was sound design, color, the multi-plane camera, or audio animatronics. Where would Pirates of the Caribbean be without them? Walt didn't miss a trick. Led by Walt's nephew, Disney Vice Chairman Roy Disney, and feature animation president Peter Schneider, the studio has continued to explore animation technology in films like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Beauty and the Beast, and The Lion King. Ironically, it wasn't Pixar's way with computers that interested Disney most. It was John Lasseter's way with characters. Say, what's that button do? I'll show you. Buzz Lightyear to the rescue. Oh, hey, Woody's got something like that. His is a pool strike. Only it. Only it sounds like a car ran over it. He happens to work with computer technique. If he were working in clay or with puppets or with models, I think of John Lasseter working with socks on his hands with two buttons sewn on it, we'd be charmed by it. The story we're telling here is very different than a story we've told before. We've never made a buddy movie. We've never made a movie set with, these kind of, with this level of contemporary human type characters. So what we're doing with John is something we've never had the license to do before. When we got the final go ahead from Disney, the green light, we couldn't believe it was actually gonna happen. You know, but like, so, so where do you start? Well, you start where, where all classic Disney animated films start, with the story and the characters. It's always a challenge anytime you try to be the first to do something. But the biggest challenge in Toy Story was not the new technology, say the film's producers, Bonnie Arnold and Ralph Guggenheim. We knew that we had a great process, uh, a technique that looked really different and it was unusual, but we knew also that what really was going to, you know, sell the picture was a story. The story came first at all times, and that was always the thing that we focused on. Woody goes over and Sarge is sitting on the table and he says, Sergeant, establish a recon post downstairs. Code Red, you know what to do. Yes, sir. All right, men, you heard him. Code Red, repeat, we're at Code Red. Recon plan, Charlie, execute. Let's move, 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 move. Just like every Disney animated film, the director, the writers, and the storyboard artist worked out the story shot by shot. And then they began casting the voices, Tom Hanks, Tim Allen, 
Myself as the voice of Bo Peep. Little Bo Peep is very dainty because she's porcelain. You know, she's gonna break. She just moves very daintily. I know Andy's excited about Buzz, but you know he'll always have a special place for you. Because we record the voices separately, we rely a lot on the director to set the scene for us. I play Bo Peep as a sort of a Betty Boopish, May Westy kind of a girl. I'm just a couple of blocks away. Wally Shawn plays Rex the dinosaur. He plays it perfectly as this neurotic, insecure wreck. What if Andy gets another dinosaur? A mean one! I just don't think I can take that kind of rejection! Perhaps people who, to themselves, are gentle and kindly, but who to others seem large and fearsome, will find my character a source of solace and uh, consolation. What's going on? If there is the there perfect casting, I think casting of the century, it is Don Rickles as Mr. Potato Head. It's on my box. Ages three and up. I'm not supposed to be babysitting Princess Drool. What are you looking at, you hockey puck? Uh, face it, if you were Mr. Potato Head and you kept losing oh, your facial features right. every Darn day of your life, you Please would have a chip on your shoulder, too. When we went over to um, originally pitch the idea to Don Rickles, it was at his home, I went in there and I had gave him a Mr. Potato Head. And when I, I handed it to him, the hat fell off, and he stood there and he was holding it, and he looked just like him. That used to be a wart, and now it's a whole, it's a whole doll. Isn't that terrific? I knew you'd come back, Woody. Jim Varney, who plays Ernest, you know, in all the Ernest movies, he plays Slinky Dog. Hey, hey, come on. And he gives him this great southern hound dog kind of quality. Let me find the moment. And, you know, to be honest, I think he used his own, his own dog for inspiration. When she wants something, she really tries to speak. It's not just a bark, it's... And she really tries to form words and make herself known. And I, so I'm, I'm sort of thinking Maggie's growl mixed with a voice. And he sort of comes out like this, so he's growling and talking at the same time. Right here, Woody. I'm ready this time. No, Slink. Oh, well, all right. You can be ready if you uh, want. No, not, not now, Slink. I got some bad news. Bad news? <laughs> Just gather everyone up for a staff meeting and be happy. Got it. Be happy. <laughs> hey, wait, what's, what's going on? A staff meeting? Hey, I didn't get any memo. <laughs> Imagine that. Nobody even told me about it. Hate to break up the staff meeting, but they're here! John Ratzenberger, who played Cliff the Mailman on Cheers, he plays Ham, the, this, this piggy bank. And he's always sitting up on the shelf seeing the whole world. So he's really kind of a Mr. Know-it-all. And, and John was just hilarious at it. Yes, sir, we're next month's garage sale fodder for sure. Any dinosaur-shaped ones? Oh, for crying out loud, they're all in boxes, you idiot. You don't seem too popular over there. When we started seeing the picture come together with our voices, we began to realize that we were a part of something Bye. groundbreaking, something really extraordinary. There's just some sort of all-encompassing kind of liquidity to it that, uh, that's uh, undeniable when you see it. I was quite amazed by it. It doesn't look like anything that I've ever seen. Where are your rebel friends now? <laughs> when that door is closed, all those toys kind of pop up, and they all have the, the characteristics and personalities that you would imagine the toys to have. And it's, it's mesmerizing. One of the things that makes Toy Story so unique is the collaboration between traditionally trained artists and animators and these computer, amazing computer geniuses. So my big job today is to act like an angry potato. Here's how it works. From the storyboards, the technical directors model the characters in three dimensions within the computer. Then the animators, like Pete Doctor, test the models of the characters to see if the animation variables or AVARs work correctly. So I would just make sure that each pose is pushed about as far as I can get it. And then I've tested a lot of the expressions. He's got great snarls and sneers. And, and then when that's done, it's ready for the animators to make the characters come alive. What we tried to do is get everything to read just in the acting, the pantomime, 
And then when you stick the face on, it'll only plus that. To give you an idea of how complicated it is, Woody has 212 animation controls just for his head, 58 for his mouth alone. Oh. While all this is going on, Ralph Eggleston and his amazing staff designed all the sets in the film. I mean, we're talking about the neighborhood, the street, the trees, the leaves on the trees, the houses, the bedrooms, the beds, the, the furniture, the, all the way down to the little dust balls in the corner. <coughs> hey, guys! Guys! Hey! Son of a building block! It's Woody! One of the things we tried to do with this film was to remove it from its... Uh, computer look you know uh, the thing that computer does easiest is straight lines and we have our share of straight lines because this is a film with a lot of architecture but uh, we tried to soften it by rounding the corners slightly here and there and uh, using a lot of specialized lighting a lot of bounce light a lot of uh, very very careful lighting a, a really great lighting crew on this film this was no accident the computer animation process from beginning to end looks like this all right, that's enough. Look, we're all very impressed with Andy's new toy. Toy? T-O-Y. Toy. Excuse me, I, I think the word you're... With the animation stored in the computer's memory, it was time to add one more vital element to the film. Getting kind of tense, aren't you? Look at the blood on this chart. I slaved weeks over it. With most of the scenes completed and the film cut to its final length, it was time to record the music. Grammy winner Randy Newman composed the score and wrote three songs for Toy Story. You can't treat it as if exactly as if it were a real picture. I mean, there's stuff you have to catch, you know, you know. You know, and if something happens like that, it looks funny if you don't. Toy Story is a bit of a departure musically from most Disney animated films. Randy Newman's songs are not sung by the Toy Story characters. Newman sings them himself. In the song Strange Things, Newman sings about how Woody's world unravels after Buzz arrives on the scene. In I Will Go Sailing No More, the songwriter has penned a heartfelt lament about the limitations of life as a toy. Newman and Grammy winner Lyle Lovett sing a duet which captures a child's love for a toy and vice versa. Toy Story definitely had a friend in Randy Newman. I like the idea of the story and I absolutely loved the uh, people. I mean, they were even good for regular people. But for show business, they're like 99th percentile, you know? These guys are professionals. They're the best. As the day of the Toy Story release drew near, the film went through the final days of post-production. Scenes were rechecked for final color and lighting, and then sent back to the lab. Actors were called back one final time for as little as one line. Wow! and the soundtrack got mixed with meticulous attention to detail. We, I can't see a thumb. We, we are in the last two weeks of production. Um, here, and we're doing the final mix here at Skywalker Ranch. This is where you take the, the music Randy Newman has done, the sound effects Gary Reitzman has done, and the dialogue and I'll balance it so that it, it, the sound is exactly what you will hear in the theater. Uh, oh yes, one uh, minor note here. 
Andrew's birthday party has been moved to today. Uh, uh, next we have what? Up, what do you mean the party's today? His birthday's not till next week. What's going on down there? In 1982, John Lasseter saw his future. Inspired by the possibilities of computer animation, he set out on a 13-year journey. With Toy Story, he has arrived, and with him, a generation of artists who use computers to imagine new stories and new worlds to set them in. The last four years of this production, the thing I'm, I, I feel the, the most satisfaction out of is the working with the people on the production. Everybody's gonna notice and talk about the fact that this is the very first computer animated feature film. But the computers are just tools. They didn't create this picture, it's the people that created the picture. And we had such a fantastic group of people. And I had so much fun working with them. And that's what I'm gonna remember for the rest of my life. When you road up ahead and you're miles and miles from your nice warm I get stuck with you. It's a movie, buddy. Yeah, you got a friend. You are cultured swine. Way to go, Idaho. You're right. Buddy, this way. Years of academy training waste. It's me and you, boy. And it's Merry Christmas, Sheriff. A friendship with me. Listen, Paul. Boop! Snap on the boss! It's on the desk, Stucky! Hey, Clubber! Got a friend in me. Yeah, you got a friend in me. We're almost there! You got a friend! I've learned so much about this medium from making this film that it's, it's given all of us ideas on what we can do in the future. And clearly, this is just the beginning. Our great Disney Channel preview weekend, your chance to sample the variety of programming that Disney Channel offers everyone in your family, continues tomorrow when there's a chance to see a rock legend in action. Seen as never before, it's Bruce Springsteen in Blood Brothers. Part 1 is tomorrow and Part 2 on Sunday at 9 o'clock, only here on the Disney Channel. Go back to your lives, citizens. Show's over. Bonifer Wagner Media.